This is Painting the Tape, a podcast by traders for traders. Join us as we embark on the journey of the game we love, tick by tick. Episode number 10. This is Leo the Tiger. We're going to talk about Delta today. So this should be an actionable podcast. And I'm not saying that mental game, the two episodes we did on mental game weren't actionable. There was some, <laughs> you know, things. <laughs> there were some, act, there's actionable things in the mental game thing. Um, but, you know, we wanted to get back to, you know, something that you could listen to, put on a chart and, you know, do some back testing or, you know, look at it, you know, have another look if you want. Um, so that's what we're going to talk about today is Delta. Stowe, AJ? Yes. Are you there? Yes. I'm here. I am Great. Here. How are you guys doing? Do you want me to go first, Stowe? <laughs> <laughs> um, it's like I'm you're doing... at a stop sign and you're both just staring at each other. <clears throat> we're, we're playing podcast Just go. Chicken. Just fucking go, man. Just, just go. Fucking um, just go. Go. I'm go. Doing, <laughs> I'm doing pretty good. I'm getting a lot more sleep than I was led to believe I was going to get. Um, with the baby, so that's good. But well, you're welcome. We actually hyped up how bad it was going to be. Yes, actually, to really <laughs> make it so that your expectations were that your wife was going to be at like legit literal <laughs> hell. Um, and now it's not, and you're relieved. It's true. I appreciate. The I gas wish that someone did that for me. Yeah, for sure. The but you're welcome. Tactical homey gaslighting. <laughs> That's pretty clutch. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, but yeah, it's it's not so bad. It's not so bad. He's uh he's pretty chill. I don't hate him yet. You know, I think it's a pretty good start. Uh, that's a great start to <laughs> not to hate your son. <laughs> <laughs> I think so. I think so. So, how you doing? Uh, I'm doing okay. I uh, I had like the worst week ever last week, kind of, and I feel like I may be climbing out of that a little bit. So that's good. Yeah, it was nice. A bunch of people on Twitter told me a bunch of stuff to check out. I listened to a couple books that a bunch of people recommended to me. One of them was pretty self-helpy. And I realized what my problem with those books are is like I just fucking zone out when they're trying to tell me the stuff. And then I get to the end and I'm like, oh, fuck, I missed all the things I was supposed to know. I don't know. Have <laughs> you guys ever <laughs> listened to a self help book like that and been like, wait, what just fucking happened? That's how I fall asleep at night. I just turn on one of those, you know, audio books or podcasts. Yeah, that's, and just, yeah, that's exactly it. And then I wake up at midnight with earbuds in my ear. I was doing lawn shit for like six hours this weekend. and But uh, you know what? Like... like you just pass all this time and you don't even know what happened. Yep. It's true. So you're just not paying attention. No. Yeah. I think that's it. I need yeah. to, uh, so I'm going to give that book another pass. Which it, book it, was it, this one? It was. Cause uh, you're a uh, hater of books. I am. No, I'm not a <laughs> hater of books. What the <laughs> fuck? <laughs> <laughs> it's called the big leap by gay Hendrix. <laughs> <laughs> Who recommended this? I don't know. Some fucking kind soul in my comments when I was uh, getting emo about my um, weird process last week. Okay. And I guess the point is that you get to, so this guy's whole deal is you get to a point where you're super successful and you didn't know that that was going to happen to you and you're mentally sabotaging that from happening to you so that you can go back to the things that you were comfortable with, which I guess kind of makes sense. Um, I didn't, I didn't quite get to anything actionable in it yet on that first listen, but I was, you know, mowing my lawn and, uh, looking for snakes. Actually, I've had a bunch of shit going on here. So it was cool. Dude, I've, um, not this, that, this particular book, but like, I've definitely like, you know, seen like a lot of, um, you know, either like psychologists or performance people or just self-help people talking about how, um, that's like such a common thing that like people, people actually want to fail. Right. Yeah, basically. Absolutely. And I fucking cannot like 
it like triggers me a little bit. I don't know. I'm not trying to come off like some kind of chat, but I can't like, I cannot even fucking fathom that. Like getting to a point where like things are going good. And it's like, no, I actually want them to be bad. Like I can't even rat. Like, is that something that really happens? Like, I don't like, do you feel like that's happening to you still? I mean, it's supposed to be subconsciously happening to me if it's happening. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that probably what happens is more um, more related to just the game that I play and not this weird subconscious need to fail. I think that what happens is if I get to a point where, like, if because I only trade, um, you know, bucket shop prop bullshit for money, you get to the point where you've passed the eval, you have a buffer, you have time to think, and then like the what next is there when really the entire process that I've created is just to get to the part where I can start to take money out. So I've, I think I've kind of backed myself into a corner with the way that I approach trading, sizing, all those different things just because I'm playing a very specific stupid game inside of a a much larger game. Mm. And so I don't think it's like psychological. I don't like, I fucking hate myself. So obviously I shouldn't have any money because I, I don't know. That would be weird. (laughs) But, um, yeah, I think it's more about like, I hit these big targets. I finally get there and then it feels like I don't really have um, a structure for the next step on those accounts. So that's what I need to focus on building and having more of a zoomed out view for, because when you're doing evals or when you're trying to reach a profit target to take money out of a prop company, you're like extremely zoomed in. You're paying attention to a bunch of, you know, tiny factors that are just unique to that situation to get to a finish line and in real trading that is not bucket shop prop world there is no finish line you're just fucking trading and so it's a little different my situation that i'm in well maybe maybe the solution is either a take the money that you've made from the bucket shop prop firms and just trade your pa or if you want to keep doing the bucket shop prop thing you know, have it be a follower on a, on a PA account that you treat correctly. Right. Yes. Yeah. Cause then you're, then you're removing at least the primary account that you're trading is not gamified. In yes. the, like it's, there's no game within the game in that. You know, I'm very, doing. I'm very close to being able to do that, but working towards pulling all that stuff out and putting it aside. And I mean, think of, think about it this way. You could even like, think of how small you could trade in your PA account. Like, I'm talking like two to four micros. Yeah. Right? For sure. And then your cop if you're copying that to several of your funded accounts, that's you could you'd be up at like probably a couple minis, you know, across all of them and you're only putting on a couple of micros on an account. Yep. It's all weird stuff to think about. <laughs> but um also last last week fucking sucked ass um in general for a lot of people. So I don't know, maybe people helped uh help them to hear that but yeah i mean um, it was very, just very a... grateful that i i have the another very important thing is have a bunch of people around you at all times that you when you say things like that on twitter they're like hey man you all right what's up don't blow up what are you gonna do and um it was very kind of aj and leo and a bunch of my other friends to be like yo man do you want to talk about this? And I was like, fuck yeah. So we talked about it and scaled down as if I was in a drawdown, get my confidence back, all the different things that we've talked about in the podcast also. Um, things to do when your process is getting weird, things to do to not blow up, to um, recenter yourself in the way that you trade. And it's it was cool. It was a good Monday. It was good today. So That's awesome, man. I'm glad to hear it. Yeah. Yeah. Last week was weird. I mean, there was the big ramp on Monday. And then we did nothing for the rest of the week until um, Thursday and Friday. Yeah, it was fucking exhausting. And then Friday was an inside day after Jackson Hole? Like, come on. (laughs) What are we doing? (laughs) It's been a long time since I was like, 
there is no fucking way I want to look at the market today. It has been a very long time since I didn't want to open the chart, and that was Friday. So I didn't even didn't even peek. It was like a oh, fuck that thing. I'll see that thing on Monday. <laughs> <laughs> it happens. <laughs> All right. Well, um, Delta. What what about what 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 about Delta? What is Delta? Delta. Um, you know, I think uh, we should well, define. On. Should we Dude, go into what the fuck? Should we go wrong? into all right? You go first. You go first. Should we what? I was gonna say, are we gonna throw in that caveat, or is that what you're about to get into first? Well, yeah, I was gonna caveat. 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 Okay, one of the aspects that we use to trade order flow. Oh, true. Yeah, the caveat is fair value delta. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Delta being in the simplest definition, the if you look at volume, you have ask volume, which is uh, orders transacted on the ask. So that would be buyers lifting offers. And then you have bid volume, which would be um, sellers hitting the bid. And so the ask minus the bid volume would equal the delta and that's how you that is the simplest definition of delta okay and the reason that we find it beneficial and well i should back up the reason that we find it a viable way to view index futures or all futures markets is because futures are unique in a certain sense that all of the volume is conducted in the same order book. And that's different from other markets, you know, where Tesla can trade on, you know, different exchanges. And so you're, if you have one exchange, you're not getting the whole picture or, you know, Bitcoin obviously trades on many different exchanges. So the unique aspect and, you know, one of the reasons that order flow itself is, um, beneficial for futures trading is because everybody's looking and participating in the same place. And so because of that, you can glean some information from looking at, all right, well, there's, you know, we have total volume and then we, you know, break out the volume by bid and ask, and then we, you know, dive deeper in that and, and, you know, do the simple math of, all right, well, what's the ask minus the bid volume? And so that's our delta. And that information can help us understand, you know, who's being the most aggressive in the market. Because in order to have a positive or a negative delta um, and at any time point, somebody has to be aggressing to the other side. And you know, that being there's bids and offers in the market, you know, on both sides of price. And if you want to buy the market, you're crossing the spread, which would be the difference between the bid and the ask, mm -hmm. and you're lifting that offer. And that would be, you know, one positive delta when you did that. Um, if you were the only, you know, person transacting at that time. Okay. So let me that let me is, ask let me ask uh several stupid questions about Delta just in case there's a lot of people that don't know what the fuck we're talking about. First question, anytime we cross the spread, which means that like if you're looking at an order flow ladder, right, there's a price that is $1 on the left and then there's a price that is $1 and one cent on the right. And that is on the left, there is a bid and on the right, there is an ask. And in order for a transaction to happen, Someone has to put a market order in to cross the spread. So when we say cross the spread, we're talking about going over and hitting the the one dollar and one cent on the ask, which is on okay. the right side. So right. that is a market order, not a limit order. Correct. Are well, all, you is, can, is delta? You can buy. You can, okay? So you can. There's two ways to do that. You can buy via market order, and that's just. You're saying I want to buy the market whatever price I get filled at. Yeah. 
Um, you can also buy the ask, and that would be as close to a limit order as you can get because, and it may be a limit order technically. This mm-hmm. is um not is something that, like, that I think about. Ask? Yeah, it's it's like um, you're lifting the first um, best available offer, right? And if you do that and you're late to the party, then you have an order there waiting to buy, you know, one dollar and one cent. Because say you hit the button and it was trading at a dollar or whatever, you buy ask at one dollar one cent, and before your order goes through, somebody's already lifted that and now price is at one dollar and two cents. But your order is to buy one dollar and one cent, so you don't right, get right. filled until the market comes back to that one dollar and one cent. So that is a a little bit of nuance, but generally speaking, I think most people, um, you know, just for simplicity's sake, would you know just understand that yes, one, if you have a limit orders on both sides of the order book, in order for something to take place. Um, somebody has to cross, you know, the spread to have a transaction occur. It's very simple, but I just before all the the fucking before all the the order flow doesn't work, people come for us. Yeah. I want to make sure that we define the shit out of what we're actually talking. We're about. going to make it as easily as understandable as possible by going into every like minutia nuance that we possibly can. Yes. As painful as it is for us to talk about crossing the spread and what the fucking spread is. Fucking nerds. Fucking okay. nerds. Just mark it in, pussies. <laughs> Any other dumb questions? Yeah, that was that um, was the first of many, I think. Is all I mean, dude, we got we got all year with this. It's gonna be all the dumb questions. Hey, it's just too stupid for us <laughs> to talk me. about. No. I'm trying to make it not stupid. <laughs> you uh, it's I feel like we are taking something that's really simple and making it like a lot more complicated, right? If you if you buy market, you hit the offer. If you sell market, you hit the bid. Depending on how heavy how like what you take delta is the difference between the market buy orders and the market sell orders. And you can look at those um, you get a horizontal measurement of that happening across price. You can get a, <coughs> you can, so you can see Delta, you can see the ask volume minus bid volume equals Delta at certain prices. And you could also see it across time, right? So you could look at the Delta within candles. Those are the basic, those are the most basic ways to look at it. Right. Okay. D- delta over time, Delta at price. Um, within that, scope, I'm just assuming that Stowe is asking these questions for the benefit of the audience because I know that he knows this shit. I know that he knows that shit too. I don't know if it's for the benefit of the audience. Maybe it is. <laughs> Maybe it is. I think. I well, think, I just don't want turkeys coming into this with like, uh, yeah, what the fuck is a bid or an offer? Like, what's a what's a price ladder? Like, what's any of this stuff? Like, how is this calculated? I have a confession. I never, ever, ever think about the spread when I'm looking at Delta, ever. Yeah, same. Not even, like... Oh, really? I have never... The words... When I'm looking at Delta and making decisions based off it, the word spread has never once cro- came into my brain. You don't have, like, a mental picture of, like, somebody crossing the spread each time? Dude, I fucking... Like dude, I cross the spread in my sleep. Well, I don't give a fuck about the spread. I mark it in and spread these nuts. That's how I feel about it. That's how you got so many bad pills today, Major. <laughs> yeah, oh, I got some fucking cough ones today. <laughs> <laughs> I got some really bad ones. But you know what we do? You know what What'd we do when it happens? <laughs> we just fucking flatten you that out. You said I either got out at 44 or 66 or somewhere in there. Good yeah. boy. Uh, there was, I, got, I definitely got filled somewhere in an 80, 80 point range there. <laughs> <laughs> what was it? Consumer sentiment today? Yeah. Um, but I don't, I don't, I think we're talking about the spread too much in the okay. context of Delta. I don't think it really fucking matters. Like, yes, you do have to cross the spread to get filled, but it's not a, it's not a predominant element of, of, of Delta measurement, the spread. Yeah. I think uh, we should move on from this conversation. Yeah. <clears throat> Look, Delta is basically a way to measure aggression and also, uh, spirit fingers a way to get a visual on passive participants Mm. because 
you know, we're going to, I think we're going to dive into this. I can dive in. We're going to talk about this later. This concept of passive aggressive uh, behavior. Delta gives you an idea of aggression, but it also gives you an idea of passive participation as well. I think we'll talk about that too. I'm with you. I'm with you. Okay. Passive and aggressive. Yeah, I was trying to make it too stupid. Sorry. You guys go. Okay. So <laughs> there's there are basically like three predominant ways to look at Delta or see it on a chart. And so just to get it out of the way, you can look at it Delta by price. And so that would be similar to a volume profile where you look at the total volume at each level, uh, each individual price. Obviously, when you have total volume, you can you know deduce the ask minus the bid volume. And so you can look at delta by price. So that's one way to look at it. Another way to look at delta would be on a footprint chart, which is basically a candlestick that shows you uh, just that it's basically like a candlestick that is essentially the time and sales of what happened in that candle. Um, so you can set up a Delta footprint. And so that allows you to go, um, back in time. You can look not only to the, the hard right edge, but you can look to the left and you can see, well, what happened back here last time we were at this price from a Delta perspective. Um, so it's a little bit different than Delta by price because Delta by price doesn't give you, uh, the story or the history of how that Delta got there. Right. So that's where footprint, you know, can come into play. Um, and then the last and the most useless, you know, completely useless way to use (laughs) Delta is uh, cumulative Delta. Oh boy. And that is uh, cumulative delta is a complete waste of time just to never look at it. Um, but it's basically just taking at the market open, it starts tracking, you know, the the accumulation of you know delta over time. Uh so cumulative delta, obviously. And, you know, it goes up and down. I joke about it being useless because, you know, you can have all kinds of divergences and you're like, and you might go, oh, well, a divergence is part of my play. All right. Well, like, so when is a divergence? Like, when are you trading the divergence and when are you trading in the direction of the cumulative delta? Nobody's been able to answer that. And then two, um, <laughs> you never know, like, if the positive. Okay. So just for an, just to use an extreme example, um, ES is trading like 5650 right and let's say 10,000 lots are bought at 5650 well guess what the cumulative delta is going to do if the average you know is like 5 or 600 delta at each price it's going to go like shoot straight up so then let's just say price starts going down right well like you it looks like a ton of buying just came into the market and you know price is going down that's divergence but you never know where that happened if you're just looking at cumulative delta. All right. So now that we know the three types of delta, AJ, did you have something? Um, no, <clears throat> I did All not. Right. I I was I was about to challenge you on cumulative delta, but I don't know really enough to really even put up a good argument. So I'm just gonna I'm just gonna say nothing. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Fair enough. There, all right, so like, there's, there's something that, all right. So I don't, I don't use cumulative delta, but there is something that I looked at recently that, like, I don't even, it's not, I don't even fucking know enough about it to really explain my thoughts. So it's really not worth getting into. Um, I don't have any cumulative delta. I don't have cumulative delta in my chart. I don't use it for any setups. I don't know if it's total hundred percent useless. I'm sure. I'm that, being a bit pedantic there. Okay. Okay. I think there are. Probably there might be times where cumulative delta can possibly give you a clue about the strength of of how hard something might reverse if it does. But I do not have this idea fleshed out enough to explain on this podcast. 
and I do not have the ability to just finish what I'm about to say. So that's why I decided to say nothing. All right. <laughs> <laughs> AJ, I think you haven't spoken enough. So why don't you take us through kind of the next, you know, steps sure. on um, so, you know, different you know, like session profiles, what we use a lot. So obviously, you know, sure. Why do we- so, so <clears throat> I would say the main use case that, you know, well, one of the main use cases that we use, the one that's definitely most predominant on our charts are the Delta by, uh, Delta by price, which we also call Delta profile. Um, I think the, like the, the one that most people probably look at is the session prof, uh, Delta profile. So basically, um, let's just talk Ooh, about we on that. I don't just, use session profile anymore. I do. The, the Royal we like uh, most people, most okay. people, most people just use session. Un- profile. They're unsophisticated then. I still have that thing on main chart and then, uh, yeah, we'll get into the, yeah. Delta on the dawn, but yeah. Okay. Oh yeah. Well, we'll we're, I'm starting like highest, then working our way down. I don't. I don't use. Do any of us use like a higher time frame Delta profile? Anything beyond a higher than a session? Nah. No. No. The answer is no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So none of us use a higher higher than uh, a session profile, and a lot of people use a session profile. So basically, a session profile is what it sounds like. You you set your chart. Uh, to reset by certain sessions so um like globex would be a session so you can see like from the the globex open at 6 p.m eastern to you know up until 9 30 would be one and then it resets at rth and then you would get uh the entire the entire uh delta by price um layout for that session time um so i have that on my chart and that just kind of gives me a general it just shows me i guess the best way to describe it it's like kind of a summary of like all order flow that's taken place for the session because every market order that is filled at every price is accounted for um for the entire session um and there are important context clues that are provided um for example, um, you see areas of absorption, right? Those passive participants that Leo was referring to. So when you see, um, let's say at the at either, let's talk about like at the high of a profile. Like a lot of times near the high of the day, whatever ends up being in hindsight, you will see a lot of positive delta. So market buys that got filled on the offer. And so a lot of times what that indicates is that a passive seller stepped in somewhere, wherever high of day ends up being, and they, they took in all the buying, right? And the aggressive buyers, the aggressive participants that are market buying, couldn't chew through all of that offer. And that's why price ends up coming off, you know, the, the high and coming back into, you know, into value or the lows or whatever it ended up doing. So, okay, but you just you brought up a new term that we haven't used yet. So, can we just sure. cover that? Which one? Absorption. Passive. The passive seller. What does that mean? Right. Sure. So, just- yeah, and a, a passive seller is a or or passive seller is because we don't know. I mean, some folks pretend that they know if it's one or more people. But basically, um, passive participants are people that are um, providing a lot of offer uh, liquidity. So, or let's just say offers. Like people are providing offers um, at a certain price ongoingly. And it's basically bringing a halt to the buying, right? So, you know, we referenced earlier that um, positive offer delta is when someone market buys and lifts the offer. Well, in this case, the offer isn't really getting lifted very much because there's so much that the offer is being reloaded, basically, right? People are market buying and market buying, but there's just more offers being thrown on the ladder and it stops price from from lifting really any further. 
And so that's kind of pat that that's what like when I refer to passive participants are it's people that are not crossing the spread, right? They're pr- they're putting their orders on the book in the form of of limit orders and that's that's the that's what makes it passive. They're saying we're going to provide limit cells at this price in, until we feel like it and they have a lot of um they can put on a lot of size. So that's you what is the up term bringing. liquidity at this point? Liquidity, correct. Yeah. Well, I don't I don't know if I don't know if liquidity is too much of a buzzword for folks. Uh, I mean, and it's also good to point out that like nobody knows what these people are up to. Um, that nobody knows their intentions. The only thing you can see is that like people are crossing the spread from a uh, bid to ask. The ask is getting eaten up, and then it creates all of this positive delta, right? Right. Well, that's that's the the truth. A lot of folks will tell you that they can look at you know a certain that like liquidity being provided at a certain price, and it's like, oh well, that's a hedge for some kind of options play, right? People will say that. And I think our opinion is that they're full of shit. Yeah. Right. I mean, I think our base opinion is that like, who gives a fuck? It literally doesn't matter. That's even more, that's even, that's equally or more true. I mean, um, we see the number there and that's the only thing that matters in the moment. So yeah. what, do, okay. So what does matter then? What matters is if you are someone that's looking to either take a position put a position on or take a position off and you're seeing this significant passive participation at a certain price it can cause you to do one thing let's say you're long right you're you're long and in profit and price is trading the high high of day and you see this passive participation this might be a good place to start taking profit because there's no guarantee that the buyers that you're along with are going to be able to push past this area of liquidity. There's obviously like, you know, you've got two opposite forces um, at play at this, at this moment, you've got aggressive buyers and passive sellers. I don't personally, when I see that, I don't know who's going to win for sure. You know, obviously my bets with the buyers, but if I'm in profit and I see someone standing in the way um, at a logical spot, I'll take some, I'll take some contracts off or, if I'm if it's at a really logical spot, I'll just cut my trade and reassess later. I'm a small fish in a big pond. I'm not gonna if if I have a really good trade going, I'm not gonna leave money on the table when someone with massive size is is trying to stand in my way, unless I have really good reason. Um, to have to have a really really good reason to hold through that. I, um, I got a lot of shit for this um, on August fifteenth. But I was long on the on the day, and we ran into a ton of this exact situ- exact situation at um, nineteen thousand four hundred, and it was some dude that came in with a thousand lots, which is a lot for NQ to see on the day, and I scaled the fuck out of that because I was like, okay, I have no clue what's going to happen now, but we have found the the chat of sellers, and I'm just an idiot tagging along. So like, this is part of tagging along for me. This is part of what breeding Delta means is, okay, we found a seller. We found somebody that's trying to sell here. We don't know why they're trying to sell, but they're really trying to sell. So I scaled out and that guy got fucking nuked. And then I, you know, well, now you're just, you just made an assumption though, that that offer was a intentional seller. Oh sure, yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't mean to make any intention other than to say like price went much further past that. Dude. I mean, we can so, say he got nuked because that sounds fun. Yeah, but in reality, no, you're right. We have no it, idea. It what could just be there. a guy taking profit or hedging, you know, a position. Yeah. I think the important thing that There's, you know, yeah. if I were to point out, you know, just as a as an aside, that the reality is is that we don't know, right? Nobody knows the intention of, you know, large bids or large offers that are placed in the market, no matter how many people looking at the same information yeah. tell you otherwise. Nobody knows <laughs> that if somebody has 5,000 lots on the bid, that that's a buyer. 
you're making so many assumptions, it's hilarious. A, you're assuming that this person is directionally looking at a market, you know, a directional market outlook, right? And B, that, you know, they are trying to get, you know, filled 500 lots at this one particular price. It could be a host of other things. Take profit, hedge against options, you know, whatever. I think the important thing to call out is that it's not so much the intention of the participants that you can see from a Delta perspective. It is how does the market react to those large outlier type of events? So like in your case, the 19,400 guy, yep. um, he's still, I can see it on my longer term volume profile. There's a ledge there. What happened after that guy got filled is that the market went straight up. Yep. And the point of that is that, you know, there was a huge offer in the market and it got filled. And guess what? There were more buyers ready to come in. And so when I see that and I see the guy get filled and I see price run past, you know, the market doesn't care that somebody just sold a thousand lots for any, no matter what you know, the other participants out there can see that order get filled. So it's not like everybody's blind to it. Um, and so I think how the market reacts to those orders is, is what you can take away. I mean, that's the context. Yes. Right. And that's all that we're, uh, that's all that I'm really trying to find with Delta context in general is just like, okay, you identify a situation, you identify a, you can call it a inflection point. You can call it, um, I, I don't know. You can call it whatever, but like you identify a moment and then how does the market react to that person's position that is clearly a large position or clearly right. an intentional position? Is it absorbed? Is it and then exhausted and then it goes in their favor? Is it because, yeah, we don't know what the hell these people are trying to do. There's no way to know. Um, but in that moment, Price went straight through that dude and never looked back the rest of that day. And that was an excellent context clue. Yeah. yeah the, the why it's happening <clears throat> is irrelevant to, to most people. Probably everyone listening to this podcast, it's the what happens next. That's important. Yeah. Um, yes. So that's, that's all one way to... Um, that we utilize the the delta profile is to look at areas where we can observe um, passive participants with significant size, and then watch what happens from those areas for kind of context clues for for any decisions that we're we're looking to make, right? And it's 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 both sig- like really large orders, or it can be just areas where it's not necessarily one large order, but it's like it's many small orders because they don't owe like it can be either one, right? Like someone could, that guy who in the, your guy's example, sure. He, he put all, he put all a thousand lots out on pretty much at once, but he could have just as easily like, I guess um, had an algorithm, right. Or some kind of trading software that's firing them off like once, twos at a time. And you don't really see it on the book very obviously, right? It's like, obviously it's ob- when you have a big order like that, it's obvious, but it doesn't always happen like that. It can be lots of little orders broken up, um, kind of rapid fired. Yeah, there's yeah all kinds of execution algorithms or whatever the fuck you want to. Yeah, say happens. Who knows who's doing this? I don't. Yeah. Know. Well, that's what's what's cool about Delta is no matter how the execution algorithm is, um how it's being fired off you're going to see that net number no matter how it's broken up on the profile that's why futures have an edge is because you get to see the whole story no matter what right so yes session profile is going to show you where it's going to show you clusters of large passive participants all up and down the profile and you can use that for entry and exit um now, beyond the session profile, you could actually break it down even more than that and break it down. Like, well, one way to break it down is to actually 
isolate the delta within a you know a certain rotation. Mm. So what that means is right, the market moves up and down right every day. Sometimes sometimes it goes straight up and sometimes it goes straight down. <laughs> There's not a whole lot of rotation. Um, but anyway, you can you can basically isolate delta within just a certain portion of the session's price action. So for example, I mean, um, I think we've we've definitely covered this in certain um in some of our trade reviews. You know, something that I like to do is when we have like kind of a trend leg up or just like a strong move up, I like to look at the delta just in that I like to isolate the delta there. And I do that because I'm looking for for certain clues that I like to see um for where the market's getting bid on a move up. And Basically, it kind of filters out some of the data that might be in the session profile and kind of give me a more zoomed in look on what's been happening recently. And I find that there's a lot of utility there because, you know, as an intraday trader, you know, my average hold time is probably like, you know, I don't know. I, I would say my hold time is anywhere like my first TP1 is probably hold for a couple minutes. You know, when I get a good move, I mean, I might be holding for 34 minutes, um, 30 or 40 minutes. And, but when I'm taking a trade like that, I don't necessarily need to see the Delta for the past four hours, right? I need to know what's been happening recently. So I have found that, you know, because of the, the very short time frame that I'm operating on, um, isolating the most recent information by only bringing in some of it into my view has been, has been incredibly helpful. Um, but it's the same concept. It's showing where the um, passive participants are loading up, what's happening with market orders. It's the same look as the session profile. It's just isolated on a, and on a shorter time frame. Well, and I think that um, that information isolation, you know, is, is it's almost like having a, you know, if you don't want to have a footprint chart in your, in your view, um, it's almost like having a footprint chart on a particular, you know, particular leg of an auction. Absolutely. And so you're just kind of watching that and you're able to see as you're watching, you know, the volume profile build out, um, in that leg, you can also watch the Delta and see how, you know, look for those points that we, you know, look for from a Delta standpoint. Yes, you definitely can accomplish a very similar you can accomplish it's a, it's a, it's the same result with a different look by by using the footprint profile and I, I've used the footprint in the past too I, and I know you have also at times right Leo yeah I I mean it's still on my chart today it serves a different purpose than it used to right but um yes I do still and I ever, used yeah go ahead. I used to be very active with mine um. But now it's just, it's the, what I'm looking for is automated or, you know, now, so I don't really look at it now. Right. But yeah, there's, there's a ton of, there's a ton of value, no matter whether you use it a footprint or using a Delta profile, a certain leg, um, that isolation definitely, it, it, it provides, it provides a ton of value. And I think it's something that, um, so I think a lot of people don't maybe, maybe they're maybe they don't lead into it as much as they should. Or I think the issue I have with footprints is they can be, I don't want to say they could be a little noisier, whereas the, mm. the leg to leg Delta profile kind of cleans it up. I, yeah. I don't want to speak for everyone, but that's how I feel. I feel. No, I agree. I'm mean, yeah, yeah, I agree. I think the Ben like, okay. So like you have your session profile that tells you about the Delta for the whole session. Right. Right. Um, then you have your leg to leg profile from a Delta standpoint, and that can tell you, um, you know, how, what Delta is doing at the right edge, right. As that volume, as that volume is building out in that leg. Mm -hmm. So it gives you that real time look into the current, you know, auction, the current move. Mm -hmm. And then the footprint, if you're using a footprint, uh, from a Delta standpoint, that's going to give you. Um, not only what's happening right now, but also what's happened in the past. So you can look to the left and you can go, okay, well, we had, you know, 900 lots positive Delta last time we were here. So there was a passive, you know, some, somebody um, last time we were here and now we're back. And so what am I looking for? 
right? right. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, from and so I think that's one of the yeah. that's the benefit that a footprint does give you is the ability to you know look to the left and be like, okay, well, what did we do last time we were here? Right, and you can see that definitely, definitely. Yeah, I like to have the session put um, delta footprint on just my general chart, and then on the DOM, I have it set to reset every thirty points. I think. Um, so that's, uh, that's more like you're in the shit. You need to see somebody reacting at a level. Like that's how you can see it without having to look and do the calculation on how much is being added to the Delta that was already there. Because if you're, if you're trying to trade a spot that was already traded at, um, nine 30 and it's ten forty five it's more important to see like that Delta in real time than it is to try to do that math as it stacks back up on the Oh on yeah. Thing, so so right. I think this is really important. And I think that this is something that I think I know helps me and Leo and, and still a lot in terms of kind of getting value from the Dom in NQ because anyone that's looked at the Dom in NQ, you know, that it they the thing is fucking it's, <laughs> it's like wig, it's a wiggly he wigged yeah that's just putting it lightly <laughs> you know the orders are flying across the tape the dom is moving up and down sometimes the spread is like fucking 16 ticks depending on the volatility um nq dom reading is a fucking crackheads game <laughs> and so i think that in some other markets you see Dom traders being able to kind of ascertain certain nuances from just looking at like the the time and sales and how the orders are moving like on the ladder. And that is a, that is a, listen, if, if you are able to do that on IQ, you are a fucking Chad, right? Like there's just so, it's so much information all at once. It's, it's hard. I think that having a very short time frame delta profile on the DOM, like I use something similar to Stow in the sense that um, it's, a, it's a delta profile that basically resets every time the market makes a new 20, makes a 20 point rotation in a new direction. I think Stow said he uses 30 points. Yeah. But essentially, it's so it's a, it's a delta profile on the DOM. And as orders are being filled, like as the DOM, price is moving up and down and as orders come into the market you're seeing that volume pro you're seeing that delta profile develop so you're kind of getting um almost like it's like a summary of what's happening at price on the dom so you don't need to process every single market order as it comes through on the time of sales because you're getting the you're getting the delta calculation on the dom and you're kind of seeing how price is coming into areas of um on the delta profile on the dom you're seeing how it's reacting at those areas that are starting to kind of pool liquidity right like on a very short time frame as the dom moves up and down right it's going to pause at the bottom of rotation at the bottom of the rotation where there's a lot of bid liquidity and that's you know possible place to get long if you're looking to take a trade there and vice versa, um, when it comes into um, an area of offer liquidity on a very short time frame, and you're looking to take a short uh, short trade there, that could be a clue for you there. So you're kind of getting a sense of where to be looking to take your entries, um, looking at the DOM without having to process every single order that comes through. Would you guys say that I explained I mean, that fair, in a fair way? Or, or exits. I, the, or the exits. Way that it, or the exits. way that it saves my ass, honestly, all the time, is when I am about to be wrong. And like I'm trying to buy the bottom of a range. I'm trying to buy a RTH a retest um, off of a opening drive higher. And I just see offer delta just fucking pounding pounding and you can see it on the dom when you have it set to this tiny setting which you couldn't necessarily see on the um, delta by price Mm -hmm. and you're just like dude they're fucking they're barreling into this thing i gotta get out of here and then i mean it's not necessarily a good spot to get short 
but it's certainly a good spot to rethink your trade. And I always flatten out of those things when I see everybody just jamming into my face like that. <laughs> and there's no other way to see it than um, to put this tiny rotation delta study on because NQ moves faster than, I don't know, any human eye can look at, especially like, I don't know, I'm 39. I'm pretty old. I, I wear glasses. <laughs> I can't see that well. Practically geriatric. Yeah, right? So, yeah, it's it's a good help for me in that in those regards. But yeah, do you have anything you want to add? No, you guys nailed it. So, thank you for not forcing me to have to speak. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> I know how much you hate doing podcasts. <laughs> no, so, I, I mean, yeah. yeah that's it. So, cool. I, I think the next step in this process is to you know, I've certainly heard the term trap traders before. Yes. Um, it always comes up when we start talking about Delta. And, uh, you know, I don't know that I totally believe in the concept necessarily, but why don't we uh, hash through it? Okay. AJ, you don't believe you in trap traders? Things? Um, well, yeah, let, let, just, let me explain it. Let me explain what yeah. we mean by trap traders and okay. then let, we'll let Leo go into some nuance. So trap traders is a popular, um, I don't want to say setup, right? It's, I guess it's a, it's a, it's a popular condition that people look at to identify, um, an area to maybe take a trade. And it's, it kind of goes back to what we were talking about earlier in those areas on the delta profile where you see a significant either let's add it either at a session high or low or a rotation high or low you see a whole lot of one-sided delta so in the example of a low you might have a ton of negative bid delta and we're talking like hundreds in the case in the case of nq hundreds or thousands of of negative accumulated bid of neg negative bid delta at the bottom. And so what people will kind of say is, oh, like sellers are getting trapped down there, right? They're, they're selling, they're shorting the low. They're not getting anywhere for their effort and they're going to get trapped and then we'll get a short squeeze because they'll get, they'll get put off sides and they'll stop mm -hmm. out and it'll bring the market up. Right. And it's vice versa for longs, right? Buyers stuck at the high day. They're buying hundreds, thousands of lots. Price isn't going anywhere. Um, eventually, they get caught off sides and you get a liquidation break. So it's, it's the whole concept of the, the aggressive participants that are entering at market at either the high or low. If they get caught off sides, they're trapped. They're trapped in a bad position and it's going to lead to a move in the opposite direction. Right, that's that's the the concept of trap traders. I think so, and because um, also a thing that's said a lot is market orders. Um, the stop losses are market orders, so that that's another thing that I, has been thrown around a ton. You're like, you're going to see people get stopped out if they're trapped. Right, you're, exactly. You're going to see people try to cover again if they get back to that price again. So, Leo, why why don't you like that? Why don't you well, like the concept of trapped? I don't necessarily disagree that that story isn't playing out, right? <laughs> right? Um, I think that, you know, in concept, obviously at every single high and low in the market, there are a lot of bids at the lows and lots of offers at the highs, but I don't know that I believe that it's necessarily from trapped quote unquote trap participants. But I think the story is more about the other side of that trade and being that the passive participants are stepping in. And the reason the market rotates away is because they're giving so much liquidity to the market that it's kind of having to stop and go the other way. Um, so, you know, in your scenarios, like that story sounds great, but, um, and that's certainly happening, but I think the story, the more, you know, believable, I guess, story for me is that the passive participants who really do control 
the market in a certain sense. Um, and uh, people are going to fight me on that one. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, if we're trading and then Q say we're trading 19,600, right. And all of a sudden, you know, there's somebody that's, that has a lot of offers to fill that would be a passive participant. And so they're just going to, you know, continue to reload the offer at that. Let's say it's from 19,600 to 605. Maybe that's like a, you know, price zone. They're just getting at, you know, they're just absolutely just sitting on the offer. Um, and what I mean by that is sitting on the offer is just every time they get filled, they reload it. Right. So they put more on the offer, they get filled, they put more on, they put more on. And so when all those buyers are coming into that offer and, you know, they're not moving price, well, obviously they're going to, you know, puke up and the, the market's going to rotate down. Um, but, and, and so I think there's certain element of the trap trader story that, that is playing out. But I think if you look at it from the other side of the trade, it's just that there's so much liquidity on that one side of the market being provided that you know is absorbing all of that bind that you know they're actually that passive participant is actually to take control of the market because they're forcing those buyers to you know kind of you know cover their position by you know because they become sellers um and so then the trade is you know just to trade in that direction and then if we come back to that 19,600 you know, that's where you have a, another opportunity to take the trade because now you've seen that passive seller. Um, and, and again, we say seller, we don't necessarily mean it's somebody intentionally trying to force the market down, but it's just that there's a lot of offer being, you know, you know, put on the books there. Um, and the market's going to react to that, that liquidity in one way or another. And so we've seen the reaction when we've seen that buyers aren't able to get through it. And so when we come back to that, those prices, um, our assumption or, you know, a lot of times is that when we do come back, that those same passive sellers are still going to be there. And then AJ's story about the trap traders is that there's some people that are holding, you know, those positions to hopefully break even. And those people also become sellers too um, when we get to that price. So there's even more, um, you know, sell pressure, you know, when we come back to that spot as well. And that's really how resistance, you know, can, you know, gets built up or support for that matter. Um, you know, because we come, we have a swing, we rotate, and then we come back to it and, you know, it gets, you know, bid or offered again. And so that's, that's kind of like, okay, well now that's, you know, resistance or now that's support kind of, um, you know, because it's being off, obviously if it's being offered, then, you know, that that's turning into resistance and buyers aren't able to get through it. Right. Mm -hmm. well, um, yeah, absolutely. And one of the most interesting ways you can, uh, uh, use that session Delta profile idea in that you're like, using it to your own rotation like either way you're zoomed in on the delta that's happening at that moment it's once you see um offer delta pile in at the lows that are like they're relentlessly piling in at the lows and when you see that overriding the bid delta that it's it's really astounding to know like when a level is about to break either way and then same with bid bid delta too it's um when you see that everybody getting extremely aggressive at the at the highs or the lows, people are trying to break balances all the time, and sometimes they fuck that up, and sometimes they don't. Um, but it's as as I don't know as somebody who's trying to figure out how to trade trend stuff alongside balance stuff. Um, that has really helped me to have uh, the session delta profile on to see that aggressiveness in that moment happen mm -hmm. i love that stuff yeah it's wild when you're yeah. like oh my god fuck they're, they're fucking coming with everything it's crazy mm -hmm. <laughs> they have to break this <laughs> previous day low and then you see a break and you're like oh my god they got 50 points good for them 
<laughs> that's fucking crazy. I mean, uh, that just happened like so two days getting ago. getting something done in this market is, <laughs> is wild. It's yeah. sight to behold. Um, okay, so I think the last thing that you can really pick off if you're watching Delta Profiles is icebergs and another really popular topic for some reason. Um, yeah, but I'm going to let you take this one. I, and I'm not, I'm not qualified to talk about icebergs. So really it's easy to spot them when you're looking at a Delta profile because, um, Delta by price specifically, because when, especially in ES, much easier to spot. Yeah. Um, you know, when you're looking at Delta by price and, you know, most prices have, you know, a couple, you know, 300, 400, you know, kind of back and forth all the way up the profile, we come up to a point and, you know, the market's moving, right? Say up or down. Let's just say the market's moving down. Okay. And we're, you know, three to 400 lots or a thousand lots of negative, negative or positive Delta on the way. It's two way trade. Um, and then all of a sudden that Delta profile, you know, shoots over 5,000, you know, negative Delta, um, it happens instantly. So what that means is that likely there was an iceberg and that iceberg order just got filled by, you know, all the other participants out there in an iceberg. Yeah. This is very simple. I mean, just think the word iceberg. Okay. So if you have 5,000 lots of, um, you know, bid orders to fill on ES, you're not going to put all 5,000 out there, right? You're just going to put, you know, 20 or 30, uh, you know, whatever is in, in confluence with whatever the current, you know, bids and offers are, you're going to be around that size. Um, and then instantly when, when those get filled, um, you know, that order, that 5,000 lot order gets refilled, right? So maybe you do that a hundred at, at a time. And, you know, ES is extremely efficient at doing these. Um, you know, it just kind of, it happens instantly. Um, yeah. So you can see that those iceberg orders by watching a Delta profile. Um, but what happens next is, is just as important as the conversation we just had with trap traders. Right. It's, you know, there's a very large passive bid that just came in in that example, um, put 5,000, you know, filled 5,000 lots on the bid. And that means that there were 5,000, you know, sellers sold 5,000 lots at that spot. Um, and so what happens next is the most important thing, right? Uh, it's not that, oh, you know, there's 5,000, you know, people that are net short. We don't know how, you know, why those bids got filled, but, um, you know, there's a passive bid there and, um, the, e that's an easy way to see icebergs and what you do with that information, I think is kind of a different story. But, um, if you're looking for, you know, icebergs, that's a, an easy, yeah, it's using Delta as a tool. That's, that's the way you can do it. Yeah, there's no way to like figure out a strategy for everybody for that, but it's the same as just like, I don't know, like what I said with the 19400 dude, like that guy was a thousand lots on NQ. That's a big position. Don't have a fucking clue what he's going to do. And it price mooned right out of his offer. And right. so, yeah, so it's like, that's a great inflection point. Yeah. You have that now. Like, okay. Something just happened in the market that is unusual, is big. Um, yeah, it definitely happens in ES a lot more and is much more annoying and grindy. Uh, I don't trade ES anymore for that reason, but yeah. Um, you, you, yeah. Well, and honestly, a couple of years ago, the, you know, those deltas used to come in much bigger. Um, you know, they may be like a 10,000 lot, you know, iceberg order. And those, you could fade those so easily. <laughs> um, like you could just insta sell and, you know, it seems like everybody else would too. And it's, I don't know that it's necessarily the same, uh, today in today's world. But that's the benefit of trading futures. Like we get to see 
every tiny speck of information. Right. Yep. We can we can see all the shit. There's no dark pool. There's no fucking except for there's dark. You know there are dark pools in Robin Hood. There's uh, not dark contracts. pools in Futures Robin Hood. <laughs> is, is that a meme? <laughs> yeah, I think so. <laughs> Does Robin Hood have futures? I don't think so. Oh, man. I think there are um, talks of that happening, maybe. Jesus fucking Christmas. Could you imagine? Wait. AJ, now that you're, um, we got through the iceberg conversation, are you comfortable speaking again? <laughs> <laughs> you know what? It's, it's not that icebergs make me uncomfortable. It's just that like people get so excited when they see one. Sure. And I like, I, d- I don't really know. Like, I just don't, what's the difference between like an ice, like it doesn't make any difference between, to me, between an iceberg or if there's like just a bunch of other people putting Uh, like, I don't know. You're just not, you're just not old enough. I mean, you understand like once you get into your. Like is the Titanic? No, no, no. It's like once you turn 40, you're like, ooh, a blue jay. You just just like like to see stuff that's interesting. Yeah, you just like to see, you're like, ooh, look at that. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, I think that. blue jay. I think that um, I think they're marketed. I you know, an it, iceberg indicator is a thing. So I think like we can't shit yeah. on book map again, dude. Oh, we did it one time. I didn't have. I didn't. This was a sub. I'm not even saying that you're sub other shitting. Sub shitting. <laughs> I'm not saying book map specifically. I'm just saying Who that. Who else markets icebergs? Uh, I don't is know. It, I'm ICT, sure other people. It, it there's got to be concept? other people. <laughs> I don't know if I don't know if we have enough time to get into an ICT rant. Yeah, we're we're pretty long in the tooth here. Do you have um, something that you need to get off your chest that we can? Could you yeah, Leo. See? Do you have anything going on on the internet that you? Are you be- baiting me? No, no, <laughs> never. No, no, no. All right, all right. All right. Said all he needs to said. I listen. Thing, I listen. Listen. <laughs> <laughs> I have decided to tweet a little more frequently. Oh. And you know what? The Twitter is different. We're it's a strange. different it's a different animal than it used to be when I was, you know, much more active, say a year ago or six months ago. Um, and I think what it is, my conclusion on this is that because of the way you know, Twitter or X is being, you know, modified with the for you page becoming, you know, working a little more like TikTok. is that, you know, when people, when your tweet or your, how does we still call it tweet. So like when your tweet, you know, starts to get some activity, then, you know, the algorithm, the algorithm picks that up and starts to serve it up to for people in the for you page. So it's not necessarily your fault, fo- like people that follow you. And for some reason that brings in, you know, obviously brings in more activity, which feeds on the, you know, which the algorithm feeds on, but it brings up, it brings in, you know, reply, the reply guys. And that's really what it is. Mm. And they have all kinds of different personalities, you know? Do you think that there are any ICT concepts that exist that um, are what? <laughs> profitable? <laughs> yes. I, I think that there are people that trade ICT. And I don't know how this went from Twitter being crazy to ICT, but let's go. We're in the ICT rant now. No. I, you know what? You don't want to do one? I can't. because. Look, there are profitable people that are, you know, using ICT stuff, and I'm not going to, um, you know, say that you can't do this. You can't. Nobody should say that. Because guess sure. what? Dante. Dante. Um, Dante. He put out a, he made a post on Sunday. I hope AJ wasn't pranking me with that Dante correction, by the it's, way. You know what? It's Josh. Josh is the one that told me that. Ah, oh, fuck. Okay. And he's oh, a big, okay. he's a big, he's a big Tom guy. He's a big Tom something guy. <laughs> so anyways, <laughs> Tom, big Tom. <laughs> yeah. So, um, 
he posted a chart on Sunday of a a hot mess. I mean, Bollinger Bands and standard deviations and all kinds of stuff. And he was like, look, in the prop, yes. you know, in the professional prop world, you know, nobody makes fun of each other's strategies. Um, but you know, if I had seen this chart on Twitter or somewhere else, I would have, you know, basically put him on blast. But then he said, this person who I know, you know, is like a $3 million trader. And I was like, okay, well take that back to the ICT thing. Go, okay. You know, for me and you, AJ, I think you probably fall into this camp too. Yeah, we're always looking to reduce, you know, take more of a reductionist approach, right? Like Mm -hmm. if you put something on your chart that's new, um, you know, more than likely it's going to come off at some point. But, you know, if it lands, then maybe you're going to take something else off. Um, But, and you're always just trying to simplify, simplify. Right. And I think where, people you know kind of get like it's it's a it's a dance between you know um simplifying to some people need or operate better with more information right they for whatever reason do better when they have all these different things going on and that puts everything into context for them or different information yeah or whatever So look, the ICT thing is there's nothing wrong with using those strategies. I think what, where I just chuckle is when they talk about, like, for example, we, uh, the three of us use all kinds of different elements of order flow. Like we just talked about how we use Delta and that's all about like the transacted volume, ask and bid volume. Like that is using order flow to make decisions and analyze the market. There's no disputing that, but I go on and, you know, I'm curious, like I read all kinds of information and, you know, tweets and I see some of the ICT, you know, folks and their lingo. I don't understand all of their lingo, but you know, they'll refer to order flow and I'm like, okay, well, what is, where's the order flow? And, um, I just see a bunch of candlesticks, so it's not, you know, I'm not trying to shit on ICT or their, you know, his strategies or people using his strategies, but I just chuckle when the term like order flow is used and, you know, it's not, it's nobody's actually, chart. it's just a candlestick chart, <laughs> right? So well, it's one, it's definitely yeah. one thing to, um, Now, like we all like jokes, all three of us really like jokes, and it's hard to find a joke funnier than someone that pretended to be kidnapped by some sort of inner circle (laughs) fucking weirdness and forced to program an algorithm that runs the stock market and then somehow escaped to form a YouTube channel (laughs) based on said algorithm. (laughs) Like, that's very funny. And it's hard not to laugh at people that take that seriously or th- that thing in itself. Of course, there's millions of ways to make money. If And and that Dante or Dante post was so sick because it was like, it's exactly what everything should be. It's, this is what works for you. Are you able to make money doing this? Great. But like, with all the stuff that we share on here, with all this stuff we shared today with Delta, like that might not be applicable to literally anyone. Maybe you don't need this shit at all, but it might be a curiosity you can check out and maybe it adds something to your trading. Maybe it, um, maybe you find a new idea within that with all the ideas that we shared. Like that's the entire point. Like we're not telling you to put Delta by price on your chart and only look at bid and ask and then dig into a dom like mm-hmm. not at all also no one kidnapped aj and made him fucking write the session delta profile thing with it refreshes every fucking 20 minutes <laughs> so i see but it's still I, fucking good jokes you have like you have yeah. to understand ict people if you're listening to this do you know how fucking great of a joke this is it's hard it's hard not to make fun of it 
So ICT concepts, not necessarily bad. ICT lore, patently hilarious. The hilarious. lore is, the <laughs> yeah. lore is patently hilarious. And that's the great thing about it is that <laughs> there can, like, people get so serious about this stuff. I mean, <laughs> so serious. Kidnapping is a, not a joking matter, guys. <laughs> no. Especially when it's Jamie Diamond and the boys. Yeah. Okay. So that aside, <laughs> that aside, people are way too serious on the internet. Like for real, you, you guys should chill out. <laughs> that's it. That's the, that's it. Yeah. Just the important, the, f- the important message is just chill the fuck out. Chill out. <laughs> like if you're making I'm very, money, just fucking chill. Yeah. Like, we're all, all just good. here gambling on the stock market. Yes. Oh, right, really? That's right. We are all just here. Just gamblers. Gambling. With the capital G. Well, I don't think we're going to bait Leo into another fucking rant today. So I feel like I was pretty, and we got be, a bit out of him. Yeah, we did. We did. We did a diplomatic rant. <laughs> yeah. All maybe, right. Maybe we could sign us off, Leo. Yeah. Uh, if you're still here, uh, Thanks for listening to us ramble for another 90 minutes. Um, uh, we hope you come back and, you know, let us know what, what you think about these episodes. This is going to be a tough cut. I feel like I said a bunch of dumb shit. I'm going to have to. Do. Can you hear the baby crying in the background? Oh, yeah. Definitely. Oh, yeah. For sure. <laughs> <laughs> we, we're really going to pull for AI on that one. Yes, we are pulling for AI for sure. <laughs>